The Lord has had me do messages before, warning that even two Christians can be unequally yoked together. But here recently, I have seen some things, and this message is to add some balance to teachings about Christians being unequally yoked together. Because sometimes people are looking at things where a person is or where they are, and they have no idea where the person is going to be five years from now. Because the person you're ahead of spiritually may be leaps and bounds ahead of you in the next five years. But only the Lord can tell. Because with the teachings about being unequally yoked together, it is even coming down to the point of denominationalism, where if a person is not a member of your denomination, you can't date that person, court that person. If a person is not a member of your church, you can't be with that person. And the thing is, what's more important? That a person is a member of your your congregation, your denomination, or that the person is a child of God who God wants to unite you with. I did another message and I'll insert it in this video. But it's based on this glass of ice and water. And when I share the message, you will see where this came from. But sometimes people are missing the one the Lord has for them because of differences. See, ice and water look different on the outside, but internally they're the same. H2O, different forms. They're exposed to different things. But they make a great team. But sometimes people are like, I'm ice and I can't get along with water. Others are like, I'm water and I can't get along with ice. But it's carnal. And they're missing what God has for them. Because they can't see what a great team ice and water will make. If given the opportunity. So I'll insert that message here. And then I'll continue afterward with this message about unequally yoked believers because there needs to be balance. The thing is, when God brings a person into your life, when he adds someone, there are things you're going to lose. So even though you gain things, you're still going to lose things. And there are times when People, in a sense, don't want to lose themselves in a relationship. Well, two become one. You will lose things. And again, there are things you will gain, but it's going to cost, it's going to come at a loss. In the beginning, Adam was doing what the Lord had called him to do. He was naming animals, tending to the Garden of Eden. And it was the Lord who said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And in saying that, something that's going to be good for the man it was going to come at a cost to the relationship of Adam with the Lord and the Lord with Adam. And that is something that is captured when the Apostle Paul wrote about relationships in 1 Corinthians 7. And I'll read from verses 30 through 35. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is married careth for the things that belong to the Lord. He, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cared for the things that are of the world and how or how he may please his wife. So when a person is married, that person can be singularly focused on doing the work of the Lord. I know for me in ministry, in April of this year, 2022, probably published around 200 videos. On April 23rd, I remember releasing 77 videos. Those videos take time to make. Time to record, time to render the files, time to upload them, select photographs. There's a lot of work that goes into it. I have a lot of time on my hands. For someone whose situation is different, maybe have wife and children, it is different. But even for a man who the Lord as a wife and then as a child or children, the wife takes time away from the things the man can do for the Lord. Even though ministering over his family, being a father and a husband is a part of his ministry. So 
again, when the Lord adds things to a person's life, it ends up taking away. And one of the precious resource and a limited resource we have in this life is time. So again, when a person is single, that person has a lot of time to focus singularly on the Lord. If you want to be up all night praising, worshiping the Lord, that's fine. When you're married, it may not be the case. And even though they're married couples, they stay up all night worshiping the Lord. So again, even though the Lord adds things to your life, those additions will come at a cost. Things that we will be subtracted. And continuing with um, 1 Corinthians 7, there is all, there's a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cared for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cared for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So when you're single, you're spending time ministering unto the Lord. But when you're married, or even when you're pursuing a person, when you're in a courtship, you have to spend time ministering to each other. So again, even though God brings a person to your life, it's going to come at a cost. And when the Lord brings a person to your life, He knows. In a sense, it's like Him making a sacrifice. But it's not to destroy your relationship with Him, because even though the person that, that He adds to your life ends up taking things away, it should be a zero-sum gain. It should be someone who comes into your life. And when it's of God, it's going to work out. It should be someone who comes into your life, and the person just takes away and adds very little. It's going to be balanced. So continuing. And this I speak for your own profit. Not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. So even in a marriage, the husband, the wife, the family, the pets, those things become a distraction. But even though a distraction, they're still meant to draw you closer to the Lord. And a part of the reason why I'm going to incorporate this message in another message about Christians being unequally yoked is that I like to teach a balanced message on this, on this platform, on this, in this ministry. Of course, it's as the Lord inspires. But sometimes Christians can quote-unquote, miss their blessings because of how they're viewing things. Now, for the practical demonstration I have, I have this, and it's melting kind of fast because it's warm in here, but it's a glass with ice. And this is another glass with water. On the surface, they look different. Now, this is a different type of glass, but this is exterior stuff. But even on the inside, they look different. This is liquid. This is solid. But both containers came out of the same cupboard. The ice and the water, they came through the same pipe. They came through the same water filter. So the ice isn't from tap water that was placed in a refrigerator. They both went through a filtration system, which is how the Lord cleans us up for each other. So both glasses, both containers, came from the same cupboard. Both containers have a substance that is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Water, H, O. One is solid, the other is liquid. You see on the surface they appear different, but they're the same. The ice is simply frozen water. Sometimes people, because they look at things from a carnal, persp carnal perspective versus a spiritual, they see differences that look insurmountable. They make it seem as if this is not going to work. But the question is, did the Lord God bring you together? Or is he trying to bring you together? Now for this message I spoke about, even when the Lord adds to you, it's going to come at a cost. Things are going to be subtracted. 
Now with this, I'm going to put them together. But how should I do it? Should I pour the ice into the water or the water into the ice? And you may say, what difference does it make? Well, there are times when the Lord brings a man and a woman together. And the question is, How are things going to be incorporated? Which church are they both going to attend? See, things are going to come at a loss because the person the Lord has for you may not always go to your church, may not be, always be a part of your, your um, congregation. And I'll say more details for the other message, you know, I'll incorporate this one in that. So maybe from a different congregation, a different type of church. How are you going to be incorporated? Who's going to give up what? Is the man going to go after the woman or the woman going to go after the man? Is the ice going to be poured into the water or the water into the ice? Causing for some men, you are out of order because like you just gave up everything and potentially even the ministry the Lord called you to because you're going to pursue a woman. So again, two containers came from the same cupboard, two different types of H2O. And because of their processes, they're different. They're both cold, but one is frozen, frozen solid. Now I'm going to pour the water into the ice. Here, the ice is in the, is in the glass. It has room, room to expand, even room to melt. When I add the water, it's going to change things. And even you look at this and you see the ice, but also in the glass is oxygen and other components of the ambient air to include carbon, or carbon dioxide. So there's air in here. And when I add the water, it's changing things. Kind of like how when you're single, you can just sleep sideways in the bed if you want. But when you're married, you don't have that kind of room. When you're single, you want to use the bathroom at night, you turn on all the lights to go use the bathroom. When you're married, you may have to walk in the dark to go use the bathroom and not turn the light on to wake your spouse up. So it's going to come at a cost. So here it is. The ice and the water, they look different, but they're the same. H2O. Now we see the, the volume in the glass is less. There's less room for air. And yes, sometimes in a relationship, it may feel as if you're being suffocated a little bit. And yes, some relationships can be suffocating because it's not being done correctly. But there's... There's less room in here, less room to do the things that you used to do. You can't come and go as you please anymore. But is there a benefit to this ice and water? Think about how refreshing this is when someone tastes it. So ice and water, on the surface, they look different, but they're the same, just in different states. Different states. <laughs> And yes, sometimes the Lord brings someone, you and someone together, and you're not living in the same area. So the ice and water initially look different. They're in different containers, but even the containers were both made of glass. They came from the same cupboard, the same way the ice and the water came from the same refrigerator, just in different portions. And sometimes people are thinking that they're unequally yoked together, or, unequally, or would be unequally yoked because of external differences. But the thing is, the two of you are both children of God, even though you may worship Him in different ways. You may even see Him in different ways, but you're both children of God. And how can you be unequally yoked together if you're both children of God? I'll address that a little bit more in another message. But for this part, it shows, and using a practical example, of how when the Lord adds something to your or someone to your life, 
it's going to come at a cost. It's going to take things away. But even this glass is more complete. I also say this. There's still a little bit left in here and I could pour it all out. In fact, I will. There are things you have to leave behind. And all the way in Genesis 2, it speaks about a man leaving his mother and father, cleaving to his wife and becoming one flesh. So yes, there are things you'll have to leave behind and leave behind permanently. In the first Kings 19, when Elisha responded to God's call, initially he was plowing behind a yoke of oxen. They were yoked together. And when Elijah placed his mantle upon him, and Elisha recognized, recognized the Lord is calling him, Elisha wanted to kiss his parents goodbye. Then he sacrificed the yoke of oxen. He destroyed the yoke and used it for firewood. The things that he was doing at the moment, he up and left them, if you will, left his parents to go do the will of the Lord. So yes, and there are things both of you will have to leave behind so that you can come together and be one flesh. And as time is going by, the ice and water is melting, becoming one in the same container, in the hand of the Lord, two becoming one. And over time, you may start looking like each other. There are things that you start speaking certain commonalities with each other. In a sense, you lose your identity. Yes, you're still husband and wife, but you become one. But many people are afraid about changing. Many people are afraid of what they will lose. When God adds to you, you're going to lose even though you gain. And it's becoming overall a zero-sum gain. It is also written, one can put a thousand to flight, but two can put ten thousand to flight. There is power in a synergistic effect of when God brings a man and a wo woman together as husband and wife. I pray this message and the practical demonstration was as useful to me or to, useful to you as it was to me. May it be like rivers of living water and may you never thirst again after receiving this message and may it help you draw closer to the one the Lord has appointed for you and ultimately to the Lord God himself. I hope you enjoyed that message. And in that message, isn't it something, and you'll see, especially towards the end of this, how that message is truly a part of this one. It also shows how at times, on the surface, you may not see how things can come together. You may not see how things will work for the good of the Most High God. So with this relationship reality checked about unequally yoked believers, it needs to be revisited because sometimes people are being told, oh, don't date someone unless this or that. And sometimes what they're giving is good advice. When it comes to relationship, it can't be simply about what people are saying. And yes, as it is written, there's safety in a multitude of counselors, but it has to be wise counselors. In 1 Kings 22, King Ahab and Jehoshaphat, they received counsel from Zedekiah and the 400 prophets of Jezebel. They received counsel. They even said that God said, but it was a lone dissenting voice Micaiah, who gave them truly godly counsel. So one of the big things is about being led by the Spirit of God. Because sometimes people are saying they can't be in a relationship with someone. 
And the thing is, the person you're looking at and disqualifying is because the individual who's making the judgment call is not truly submitted to the Lord, him or herself. And that's why they can't see and or receive what God wants to do in their life. They're relying on what they can see as opposed to what God wants to do. So be careful that you are not using teachings about being unequally yoked together, which would disqualify the person the Lord wants to bring into your life. And apart from um, being unequally yoked together, it is linked to 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18, which reads, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So a lot of people, that part is simple. You know if someone is an unbeliever, you can't be yoked with a person. Unless, of course, at 1 Corinthians 7, you are already married to the individual. That's a different story. And that oftentimes applies to someone who was married as an unbeliever to another unbeliever. And then that person gets saved. Just because you get saved, you don't leave that marriage with unbeliever. So it's easy for many Christians to say, if a person is not a believer, then we can't be yoked together. Great job. But let me continue reading this. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? So you're speaking about Christ and Belial. Could the Lord bring a Protestant and a Catholic together in holy matrimony? Yes. Could the Lord bring a Protestant or a Catholic and a Muslim together? The answer is no. Unless the Muslim renounces being a Muslim. So I would work with a Catholic and not a Muslim. In the Surah, the part of the Quran, it says that Allah does not beget and neither does he begot, that he does not have a son, which means that it's of the Antichrist because it's a denial of Jesus the Christ, being the Son of God. So that's a major theological issue that the Lord wouldn't bring a Protestant or a Catholic and a Muslim together. And even though there are differences, at least a Protestant and a Catholic believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. While a lot of times people can focus on things not knowing how the Lord is going to change a person's point of view. So what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or in Christ with Allah? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols. I pause for a second. Could the Lord bring a Christian and a Jew together? See, it's possible. Of course, the Lord would have to do some work. Because when I say Jew, I'm not speaking about a Messianic Jew. I'm speaking about a Jew who believes that Yahweh is the Most High God. Christians believe that Yahweh is the Most High God. But the thing is, the issue with Jews and Judaism is about the Christhood of Jesus. Could the Lord enlighten the Jew to recognize that Jesus is a Christ? Yes. Now, it doesn't mean that the Christian and Jew gets married beforehand, but that'd be a part of the courtship process. Again, sometimes we can't see what's going to happen many years from now. And when I was speaking earlier, I was a man of Apostle Paul. He was persecuting Christians until he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And not to say that he necessarily went ahead of the other apostles. But when you look, the Lord called 12 men to apostleship. But most of those men we don't see any of their writings in the Bible. And yet there are so many writings of the Apostle Paul. Who foresaw that? 
who knew that Paul, someone who was persecuting Christians, would one day become a Christian, and most of the books in the New Testament, the Lord would have used him to write them. See, sometimes we're so focused on here and now, we can't see into the future. And many people will even reject what God wants to do if they are not led by the Spirit of God. So while they're pointing at fingers at others, disqualifying them or attempting to disqualify them, they're the ones who may be actually be disqualified from receiving God's best. So this thing about not being unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. There are nuances, but it's fairly easy. A person's unbeliever, leave a person alone. It continues, For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Hmm. That reminds me of Ruth. Ruth was from Moab, and out of all the women in Israel, Ruth was one the Lord had for Boaz. But a part of her being able to get into a relationship with Boaz. In Ruth 1, she renounced even her people and her God to go with Naomi to be with her people and her God. So Naomi, or Christian Ruth, renouncing her God to become a Jew. But even her, she was in the infancy of Judaism when she met Boaz. Because sometimes people are thinking, well, we're unequally yoked together because this person is young in the faith. It's kind of like ice and water. They made it the same thing. H2O. But the water, it may be cold because it's not frozen yet. The ice is frozen because it's been exposed to colder temperatures longer. So sometimes a person, they can become ice over time. They may not be there yet, but it doesn't mean the 12 of you can't be a good team together for the glory of Most High God. And the Lord continued, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be unto you, I'll be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, for a lot of people, it's easy to know that a person is not the one, because they are an unbeliever. And yes, the person could be the one, but the person is not ready yet, because the person is still an unbeliever. Which means, waiting, giving time. So the thing about being unequally yoked comes from 2 Corinthians 6, 14-18. Now being unequally yoked together as believers, it can be tied to Deuteronomy 22, verse 10, which reads, Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. A donkey is a beast of burden. An ox is a beast of burden. They can both be used to plow, but they have different workload, different strength, potentially different temperament, and together don't make a good team. So even though they're both beasts of burden, they just don't work well together. And even just a size difference. So this Deuteronomy 22.10 is what many people use to base the doctrine of Christians being unequally yoked together. And it is possible for two Christians, even two Christians in the same church, to be unequally yoked. Or if they were to get together, they would be unequally yoked. But the thing is we have to be careful that we don't start getting to a point where it's like tribalism. Because back in Israel, the Lord brought them up into tribes. And because of inheritance, Marriages were supposed to be kept within tribes. And some people married people of other nations. For example, I mentioned Boaz. Boaz's father was Salmon. Salmon married a woman named Rahab from Jericho. 
They're listed in the genealogy of Christ. Ruth gave birth to Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of David. So we see how the Lord was able to bear fruit. Rahab initially was not someone who worshipped the Lord. In fact, she was a prostitute. Imagine that. And sometimes we can look at a person's past on a disqualified individual, not knowing where the Lord is going to take the individual. So there are times when people are looking at things, and it's from a tribal mentality. Like, if I get into a relationship with this person, if we get married, I'll have to leave my church. Well, what the person is called to start a church? You have to leave your church anyhow. So you can get into a tribal mentality where if this person is not of my church, I can't even see him or her. And sadly, there are some pastors who have preached that way. Then some would make it seem as if, if the person is not of your denomination, then you're unequally yoked together. You can be cut from the same cloth, if you will, and be unequally yoked. And it can seem as if you're from different, different places. You're cut from different cloth, and you would not be equally yoked together, yet you would. For example, in Acts 23, verses 1 through 9, And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Ananias, the high priest, he was supposed to be a man of God. And why was he telling them to smite the Apostle Paul? They both believed in Yahweh. So what's the issue? What is causing that division? There are a couple of things. I continue. Then saw then Paul, then said Paul unto him, God smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they stood by and said, Revilest thou God's high priest? And I've said before, how is it Paul couldn't recognize him as the high priest? And sometimes we get in their flesh. And then, oh boy. Then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, and the son of a Pharisee, of the hope of and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. And when he had said, so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. Didn't the Pharisees believe that Yahweh was God? Didn't the Sadducees believe that Yahweh was God? So what's the issue here? Why was there division among them? Why was there so much division? They're all serving the same Yahweh. Allegedly. Paul, a Christian and a Pharisee. Then you have the Pharisees who were, most of them at least, were not Christians. And then the Sadducees. So they're all serving Yahweh. And being unequally yoked is not just simply about marriage. Yoking yourself, getting in partnerships with people. So it's not simply about marriage, but using this for a relationship. So I was Paul, a Christian, who believed that Yahweh was God. And the Pharisees, who believed that Yahweh is God. And the Sadducees, who believed that Yahweh is God. Why was there an issue with them? Similarly for a relationship. Just because the Lord brings you and a person together, it doesn't mean you will have differences. Differences in the way you see the Lord, how you approach your worship, your theology about the Lord. 
But if you all believe in the Lord, that should be the main thing. When you believe that Jesus is the Christ, that should be the main thing. And many people are losing sight of that. And even saying someone else who actually believes that Jesus is the Christ, that they're unequally yoked, when that may not be the case. I continue. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So we see some issues regarding their doctrine. But even though they had issues doctrinally, they formed a council. But also debate is a part of resolving issues. It is written that iron sharpens iron. So does a friend sharpen the countenance of his friend. And a relationship is meant to make some changes to you, to refine you. And these are, as I'm speaking, the ice and the water, they're melting, merging more and more to become like one. In a sense, in the image and likeness of the Lord. So again, for the Pharisees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. How could the Sadducees say there are no spirits, angels, or resurrection, when the scriptures that they had at the time had those things? Judges 9, 1 Kings 22, it speaks about the Lord sending, 1 Kings 22 and 1 Samuel 16, speaks about the Lord sending an evil spirit to afflict men. Um, Judges 9, Abimelech, who was a judge over Israel. 1 Kings 22, he sent a lying spirit to deceive the prophets of Jezebel in Ahab's court. 1 Samuel 16, a evil spirit from the Lord, as it is written, afflicted the rebellious King Saul. So how could the Sadducees not believe the stuff in the scriptures and say that there, was, there were no spirits, no angels or resurrection? Regarding angels, there are stories, the Exodus, a pivotal story in Judaism. The angel of the Lord was ahead of the Israelites a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The birth of Samson, it was predicted by an angel who visited his mother and later his mother and father. But yet the Sadducees didn't believe. No resurrection. The Lord used Elijah and Elisha to raise people from the dead. Would it make a relationship more challenging if you're like a Pharisee and you believe those things and the person the Lord is trying to bring you with is like a Sadducee who doesn't believe those things? Could it make a relationship more challenging? Yes. Would it mean that you're unequally yoked together? Not necessarily. So I'll continue. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. This is also nothing. Have to recognize the hand of God. What is he trying to do in your life? Because if he's trying to bring someone into your life, and you're resisting it, then you're fighting against God. In Acts 5, the apostles were brought before the Sanhedrin, Gamaliel, someone who taught Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul, he told the members of the Sanhedrin that if what the people were doing were of men, it would fail. But if it were of God, then they would find themselves fighting against God. And I submit to you that some people have used the doctrine about Christians being unequally yoked together. Yes, to sometimes reject the wrong person, but also sometimes to push away the right person by thinking they would be unequally yoked together. Because they're looking at things, even theological differences, but they're missing 
the main things. In 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 13, it is written, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined, joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Hmm. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were ye baptized in the name of of Paul. So the Apostle Paul addressing divisions in the body of Christ. And for some people, the doctrine of being unequally yoked together to include with a believer is causing ungodly divisions. In this, the Apostle Paul is speaking about some people are saying they're of Paul, Apollos, Cephas. It's kind of like how some people, if someone's not of my church, I can't be in a relationship with that person. If someone's not of my denomination, I can't be in a relationship with that person. And some are like, I just need to know that this person loves the Lord. This person is from the Lord. When God sends a person to you, how can you be unequally yoked together with a person that God sends? Whether it's for a romantic relationship or a business relationship, how can you be unequally yoked together with a person that God sends? Because ultimately, the Lord has to be in the relationship process. He has to be the one that brings it together. As it is written and as Jesus said, what God hath joined together, let no one put asunder. How many people have tried to come against what God is trying to put together by saying you can't be that person or I can't be this person because not of the same church, not of the same denomination and they're missing the bigger things such as this person is actually of the Lord. This person may actually see the Lord or may see God from the perspective of a Pharisee while I'm looking at God from the perspective of a Sadducee. And by the way, in Christianity there are divisions today like the gifts of the Spirit and some people don't say that hey I kind of see God like a Sadducee or a Pharisee but they do but in the person is still a brother or sister in Christ so sometimes people are looking at things and saying we would be unequally yoked together even if God is sending that person others are saying we would be unequally yoked together, or you would be unequally yoked together. And the thing is, is the Spirit of God leading you? Is the Spirit of God leading you? Is the Spirit of God leading those who are advising you? Because if God sends someone to you, and He's letting it know in many different ways that this is the one He sent, whether it's for a romantic relationship or otherwise, and you can't recognize it and you may be thinking we will be unequally yoked together the problem is not the other person the problem is you because you're rejecting in a sense the yoke the Lord wants to put on you and the Lord spoke about his yoke is is easy his burden is light so it's about recognizing the hand of God he has to be a part of the process um, Moses was married to Zipporah, a Cushite. And the thing is, they were married, but Zipporah was not Moses' ministry partner. Aaron was. Also, Aaron was married, had children, 
But his wife was not the co-high priest. His wife was not the co-high priest. Because sometimes people are looking at their lives how they think it's going to work out. Aaron was a high priest. His wife was not. Deborah and Huldah were prophetesses. Deborah during the time of Barak. Huldah during the time of Josiah. They were both prophetesses. They were of esteemed in, esteem in Israel. They were married. But their men were not a part of their ministry. So we have to be careful that when they're looking at things regarding how we think, things should be in the long run. With none accordance with God's will. Peter had a wife because his mother-in-law was sick. The Lord prayed for her. She got up and started ministering unto them. We hear about Peter, but we don't hear much about his wife. So sometimes people are looking at how things will work out between them but they're not looking at God's will. Is this God's will for my life? Again, sometimes people focus on more traditional things. Is this person of my church? Is this person of my denomination? And they're missing the bigger picture. Is this person of God? And is this person God's will for me? Again, divisions, nothing new. But we have to recognize the hand of God and what he wants to do in our lives. In Acts 15, verses 5 through 11, it is written, And there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed. So it's good. Like Saul of Tarsus, these men were Pharisees, but they believed that Jesus was a Christ. That's progress. Because sometimes we see a person who's like a Pharisee and we're thinking this person is always going to be a Pharisee. Now I say Pharisee, I'm speaking about having a hardened heart towards Jesus as a Christ. Or in the way they view Jesus as the Christ in the way they worship. So again, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. Also part of this, it was during the infancy of the church. So in a relationship, there's what are called growing pains. There are going to be issues. So saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So the Pharisees still had a Pharisee mindset. Yes, it was good that they came to accept Jesus as the Christ. But they still had a Pharisee mindset. And for one or potentially both people, based on where you're coming from, you may think that's where the Lord wants you to stay or in a sense where he wants you to go back. But when he cuts the umbilical cord, so to speak, it has been cut and it's time to move forward. And we have to keep on renewing our mind with the Holy Spirit, with the Word of God. So the Pharisees, in the infancy of the church, wanted people to keep on, to still keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together to consider of this matter. And when they had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by mouth should bear the word of the gospel and believe, and God which knoweth the hearts, oh boy, and God which knoweth the hearts. There's also sometimes people that don't want to go or pursue another individual or pursue a relationship with another individual because they're looking at things and they're not recognizing God knows a person's heart. In 1 Samuel 16, the Lord sent Samuel to Jesse's house to anoint one of his sons as Israel's next king. When Samuel saw Eliab, Jesse's eldest son, he thought he was going to be the Lord's anointed. The Lord told him he didn't, don't look at his height or stature, and that the Lord looks at his heart. If God is going to bring someone to you, that means God has vetted that person. 
Yes, he will give you confirmation along the way and even confirmation for others. In Genesis 24, Bethuel and his son Laban both said to Abraham's servant, who was trying to get Rebekah back with him to go marry Isaac, that a relationship was of God. So people recognize it. Whether they admit to it or not, people recognize it because of hand of God. So the Lord knows people's hearts and he vets a person. Jesse's seven sons passed by. The Lord hadn't chosen any of them. Samuel asked, do we have another son? Oh, there was the youngest out tending the sheep. Oh, go get him. We will not sit until he shows up. The Lord has had tested his heart. David was a man of the Lord's own heart. And even if his heart wasn't everywhere it needed to be at that point in time, his relationship with the Lord is going to grow closer over time. And yes, David ended up messing up as we see in 2 Samuel 11. But in 2 Samuel 12, the Lord forgave him, in part because he knew David's heart that David would repent, which he did. So in 1 Samuel 16, the Lord said that he was choosing David based on his heart. He had a heart after God. In 1 Samuel 17, when Goliath was taunting the army of Israel, when David showed up and wanted to go to battle, his eldest brother, Eliab, was talking about how he knew David's pride, knew about his, in a sense, his wicked heart. So Eliab still had negative things to say about him. So his brother, if people were listening to his own brother speak about him, they would think less of David. But who was relying on the Lord? Who was relying on the Lord for his guidance? The Lord was seeing things that others couldn't see. But Samuel, because the Spirit of God was leading him, was hearing from the Lord, and he could obey the Lord, and not relying on carnality. Again, some people are pointing at other Christians and disqualifying them as being a potential mate. But the person ultimately disqualifying is themselves, because they're not being led by the Spirit of God. So Peter in Acts 15 continued, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. I pause again. So Paul, or Peter rather, speaking about the Gentiles, and the Gentiles also having the Spirit of God. So despite which church the person attends, or the person doesn't attend church. Despite which denomination the person may identify with. Does the person have the Spirit of God? These are the more important things to look for. Not a person's church attendance, or I'll just say congregation attendance, not the person's denominational affiliation, but does the person have the Spirit of God? And also, does the Spirit of God have that person? Because it's one thing for the Holy Spirit to be given a person promptings and even more overt communications and the person not obeying. The person may still have the Holy Spirit, but it's like the Holy Spirit doesn't have the person. So the Gentiles and Jews having the same Holy Spirit. That's a commonality. It's not simply about one being Jew and another being Gentile. Them having the Holy Spirit. Are you looking for the Holy Spirit of God in the person he may have for you? Or are you looking at other things? Peter continued, and put no difference between us and them. So sometimes we have wall built up and those walls are of our own doing. It may even seem as if we are guarding our heart. But we're even guarding our hearts against the things that God has for us, the person God has for us. So purifying their heart by faith. So by faith. So it wasn't about being circumcised and keeping the law. It was by faith. So sometimes we're looking at things, and the things we're doing is actually sinful, because anything that's not of faith is sin. 
Peter continued, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able, were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they are. Because sometimes our congregational affiliation actually opens the door to pride. We start thinking, if someone's not of our church or our denomination, that person's not good enough. That is a form of pride speaking. That is a form of pride speaking. But I back up where Peter spoke about, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples that they or their fathers couldn't bear? So he speaks about a yoke. Are you open to being yoked with a person the Lord God wants to yoke you with? And I say yoke with her for a romantic relationship or another. Or does person have to be of your congregation, your denomination? Yes, congregations will have differences. Denominations will have differences. But do you have the same Holy Spirit? Is the same Holy Spirit leading you? I mentioned earlier about the Lord not bringing a Christian and a one who does not believe that Jesus is the Christ. And especially one who does not serve Yahweh. And he used the example of Muslims. In 1 John 2, 22-23 it is written, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is an antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So for Jews who do not who are not Messianic Jews who do not profess that Jesus is the Christ. Yes, that's Antichrist. That's against Christ. Jesus the Christ. And Jews who do not profess Jesus as the Messiah need to get to know him as such. If not, they're in trouble. But it is possible for someone to be like Saul of Tarsus, who believes that Yahweh is the Most High God, but does not believe in the Sonship of the Lord Jesus. But it could happen. Again, sometimes we're focused on where a person is versus where the Lord's going to take them. And sometimes we may look at a person and we could be like, oh, you're Jewish. You don't know Jesus as the Christ. When a person may be Jewish, but a person believes that Jesus is the Christ. Now, sometimes they don't profess it publicly for various reasons. And yes, there are Jews out there who believe that Jesus is the Christ. But if they were to say it publicly, their family would disown them. So kind of keep it quiet. Now you may want to be all bold saying, Oh, tell him, stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. This way, this factors in. In Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Maybe the Lord doesn't want the person to announce it right away. It requires being led by the Spirit of God. So the thing about Christians being unequally yoked together. Yes, it is possible. Well, a lot of times people are looking, is someone of my congregation, is someone of my denomination, and the person is not of my congregation and our denomination, then it's not going to work. We'll be unequally yoked together. But they're missing the bigger thing. Is the person a son of God? or a daughter of God, because that person is being led by the Holy Spirit. And in fact, it was the Holy Spirit who led that person to you. But because you, the Holy Spirit is in you, but because you are not being led by the Holy Spirit, maybe you're being led by other things, that you cannot recognize that person, because you're looking for external stuff, as opposed to the internal and eternal stuff. 
the person is from God. The person has the Spirit of God and the person is being led by the Spirit of God. So there are two Christians who could have the Spirit of God and because one is not being led by the Spirit of God, they could be unequally yoked. But it doesn't mean it can't be overcome. We need to be led by the Spirit of God. And be careful about saying you're unequally yoked together with a person who actually has the Spirit of God. And one of the potential dangers of this kind of tribal mentality has to be of my congregation or my denomination. In Matthew 11, verses 7 through 11, And as they departed, John's disciples, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? And what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. And what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. I pause for a second. Look at what Jesus is saying about John. Did, did the Lord say? Where did he go to the synagogue or the temple to see? He said in the wilderness. How many, temple, or how many synagogues were out in the wilderness? Because sometimes people are looking at a person's place in life. Oh, you're not in a church. You're not submitted to anyone. The thing is, is a person submitted to the Holy Spirit? See, we can miss things. The people had to go out to the wilderness to see John. He didn't say in the synagogues. He didn't say in the temple. They had to go out into the wilderness. John recognized Jesus as the Christ, even his mother's womb. And I thank you, my Lord. It's also nothing. John was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, as it is recorded in Luke 1. He could recognize Jesus from in the womb, Jesus as the Christ. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, who also went out to the wilderness to see John, most of them wouldn't recognize Jesus as the Christ, at least not initially. It is said that even devils were recognizing Jesus as a Christ, but those who were probably in the synagogues, every time they were open, couldn't recognize Jesus as the Christ. Many would look at the Pharisees, but Jesus said that there were whitewashed sepulchers, whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. So sometimes people are looking at the outside. Oh, this person is clean. This person is this. This person is that. Unlike that person over there who looks like John the Baptist. But Jesus called them a brood of vipers. Jesus didn't start his ministry until the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. He was led by the Spirit of God. Even Jesus was. But people would look at a Pharisee and be like, oh, this person checks the blocks. Every time the synagogues are open, they go to the temple, all this stuff. In fact, they're staunch keepers of the law, etc., etc. Even though they weren't. And they could look at carnal things. There's also a term, religious spirit. I know of two people who have had encounters with a spirit that they saw. And it was a religious spirit. And a description that they saw is a spirit that looked like a priest. But it was in dark garments. And the color of the notch, rather than being white, it was dark. And it was a religious spirit. And there's some people, they are attracted to those who are religious, but they are not in a right relationship with the Lord. They're looking at the Pharisees and the Sadducees, 
as if they check the blocks, but the relationship with the Lord is not right. Many people would think they're equally yoked together with a Pharisee and a Sadducee and miss out on someone like John, filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Someone who's out in the wilderness and not necessarily out in the synagogues every time the doors are open. It's important, and of course, at Romans 8.14, for the Spirit of God to lead us. Because He, the Spirit of truth, guides us into all truth. He also conforms us into the image of Christ Jesus. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit beyond measure. The Lord continued, For this is He of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. I pause again. This is also nothing. You may be thinking about what your assignment is from the Lord, and you're not looking at how or what the person's assignment for the Lord is. John, even though in the wilderness, that was his assignment from the Lord at that point in time. You see at Luke 1, the very end of it, how he was raised in the wilderness, and he waxed strong in spirit. Yes, he did gain favor with God and with men. So John had an assignment. It is also important to remember that even if a woman is called to ministry and a man is not, that the woman was created for the man. Because sometimes people, they're like, oh, the Lord, or a woman is saying, oh, the Lord's called me to this. And they're looking at what the man is going to do for them, forgetting the woman was created for the man. So John had an assignment to be a messenger to pave the way for the Lord. Verily, And for some people, what the Lord has called you to do during this season will change because you've entered into a courtship or even a marriage. And you may have to drop what you've been doing. But I say these things. When the Spirit of God leads you, He will lead you into all truth. I continue. The Lord continued. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there has not, hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. So I pause right there. The Lord giving his seal of approval on John the Baptist. So the thing about Christians being unequally yoked together, yes, it can happen. But how many people were looking for the seal of approval of other human beings? And again, Yes, there's safety in a multitude of counselors, but they have to be wise counselors, godly counselors. In 1 Kings 12, King Rehoboam had two sets of counselors, the elders who served with Solomon and the younger ones whom he grew up with. They gave him different advice, and he chose to go with his cohorts rather than those who served with his wise father Solomon. So he got, wise, he got advice from a multitude of counselors but only the older ones were wise. But this is not about age, because there's some people who are, eight who are older, but unfortunately, they haven't gained the wisdom commensurate with age. We look at the story of Job, his first three friends, they're saying all kind of stuff, but they were wrong. So we see Jesus putting his seal of approval on John. Are Christians looking at another Christian who has the seal of approval from the Lord and disqualifying the person because they themselves are not being led by the Spirit of God? Are you seeing a person the way the Lord sees a person? And not only how the Lord sees a person now, but what the Lord sees in the future for the person. We can be led by a carnal mindset and miss those things. Again, looking at things such as the person's congregational, 
affiliation, the person's denomination, and missing out on weightier matters. Is this person a child of God, with the Spirit of God, who is led by the Spirit of God, who has God's approval? And this is a person God has chosen for me. And not only that, this is a season the Lord has opened a door for us to be together. Those are weightier matters. So Jesus spoke highly about John. Yet, in the same Matthew 11, down to verses 18 and 19, the Lord said, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. Jesus spoke highly about John, yet others said he hath a devil. Who do you think said that? When you look at Matthew 12, Jesus healed a man of a demon, and they're saying that Jesus did that by the prince of the demons. And the Pharisees said that. So again, any advisors that you have, are they giving you wise, meaning godly counsel? So again, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath a devil. But it continues. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man, and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. So people are saying bad things about John, and they were even saying bad things about Jesus. That's why you must be led by the Spirit of God, and anyone who is advising you must be led by the Spirit of God. If not, you can have a godly opportunity in front of you, and you'll be blind to it. Or you'll get blinded to it, because someone will come up to you. And like Jesus mentioned in Luke 8, how the bird comes and snatches up the seed of God, or the seed, which is the word of God. You may allow someone to snatch up what God has for you, because it was right there, positioned in front of you. But you start thinking, well, we're both Christians, but we're unequally yoked together, or we would be. The question is why? Are both you being led by the Spirit of God to be together? I spoke about wisdom in Proverbs 9, a book of wisdom. But in Proverbs 9, verse 10, it reads, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So does the person have the Spirit of God? Is the person being led by the Spirit of God? Was the person led by the Spirit of God to you? And also, does the person fear the Spirit of the Lord? Does the person fear the Lord? Those are questions that you need to answer regarding if you're truly unequally yoked together as believers or not. And that I'm trying to put myself above anyone, but how many times have you heard messages about Christians being unequally yoked together and the messenger fails to say anything about asking the Lord for his guidance regarding that matter. And then there's this, which is arguably the key question. Regarding being yoked, who is doing yoking? People, devils, or God? If people are doing yoking, even as Christians, you can be unequally yoked together. If devils are doing yoking, more than likely they're going to try to put you with a child of the devil. But devils will also try to put two Christians together who would be unequally yoked. But if God is doing yoking, how can you be unequally yoked when the author and finish of your faith is trying to yoke you with someone else, someone he has chosen. So these are things many people overlook when it comes to truly discerning if you would be unequally yoked together with a Christian for any kind of relationship, whether it's romantic or otherwise. And I pray that you're not one of those who God sent someone and you missed that opportunity because you're thinking 
you would be unequally yoked together. But you didn't ask the Lord, who is this person? Who sent him or her? What is this person's purpose in my life? Joshua, a man of God, he messed up. In Joshua chapter 9, when the Gibeonites came to him in disguise, and the scriptures even clearly let us know, he did not inquire for the Lord about these people who had come trying to form a covenant with him. And there are many people making judgment calls about being unequally yoked together with a fellow believer, but they didn't inquire for the Lord, and in some cases, they missed it. They didn't rely on the Spirit of God. So even though they may have been, the word tacitly is coming to mind, even though they may have been looking for someone who has the Spirit of God and is being led by the Spirit of God, in that moment, they were not being led by the Spirit of God themselves. And they didn't rely on the Spirit of God. So when it comes to relationship, and about two Christians being unequally yoked, do the two of you have the Spirit of God? Are the two of you being led by the Spirit of God? Are the two of you being yoked by the Spirit of God? During the length of this message, the ice and water start melting into each other, merging, changing. The water itself got colder, the ice melted. The ice started losing its identity, but it took on another form to become one. And it's in the glass. So when you're in hands of God with another, you will change. Guaranteed, you will change. But are you still in the hands of God? I pray this message has been beneficial to you. It has been my absolute pleasure to bring it to you. And if you're someone who missed a godly opportunity, repent and let the Lord work things out. And as you go forward, please ensure that you, as a Christian, since you have the Spirit of God, ensure that the Spirit of God is leading you and that don't, you don't find yourself fighting against God because what he's trying to do with you and the life he's given to you, you can't see it, so you're rejecting it. So you want someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit, even led by the Holy Spirit, but you're not being led by the Holy Spirit yourself. But I don't say this message to condemn anyone. And if you're a person who you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you've been led by the Holy Spirit, praise the Lord. But some people learn lessons. And it's a hard lesson, but it's a lesson they won't forget in time soon. So you as a child of God, you have the Spirit of God. Ensure that He is guiding you. He will guide you into all truth. He will conform you to the image of Christ Jesus. And yet sometimes He lets you know, run away from this person, or maybe run towards this person. The person doesn't look like it now, but this is one I've chosen for you. It may be painful, but you will grow together. And in the process, you will be in my hand. Because the question is, do you trust God? God bless you. And Jesus the Christ is Lord.